when you know there's gonna be a solid swell, the fear is always there. But you have to trust that everything's gonna be good. In the 1970s, small groups of itinerant surfers found themselves deep along Mexico's Pacific coast. Some were evading a war. Others were out for adventure. All of them were looking for surf. What they found changed our perception of waves that break over sand and how they could be ridden. My name is Edwin Morales. I'm a local boy from Puerto Escondido. I was born and raised here. My great granddad used to have a coffee farm up in the mountains a very long time ago. So our family has been in the zone for quite a long time. Being a child in Puerto, there was nothing here. <laughs> There was no paved roads. The only paved road that we had was Highway 200 that goes all the way across the whole town. And since I remember, it just started growing, developing. It used to be a shipping port, coffee mainly. And around the 70s, I think, that's when American people started to come. They call them gringos. So then the gringos came in the 70s and they kind of discovered how beautiful the wave was. And that's kind of when it all started. Around the same time that the first surfers ventured down to Puerto Escondido, surfing was undergoing a radical evolution. No longer confined by the length of a cumbersome longboard, surfers could now position themselves deep inside the wave. Shortboard came on in about 69 when we all started riding shorter boards and everything at that time changed in society. All of a sudden we turned our backs on the jock athletic aspect and the hippie influence became bigger. And so it was almost like a dividing line when we all realized, hey, wait, we're not trying out for the track team or football or basketball, we're going surfing. Surf exploration in the early 70s was heavily influenced by the media, which at the time basically was Surfer magazine. 
what completely rocked our world was when Kevin Naughton and Craig Peterson, the photographer, got a cover shot on Stripper and the, the title was Discovery on the Way Home from Central America. It showed a backdoor pipeline type wave and it wasn't soft like Malibu. The wave was barreling. And we went, like, oh my God, pipelines come to Mexico. Nobody had told us about Petacalco, but there was a rumor about this big wave somewhere in Mexico. The counterculture environment at that time in the early 70s was a progression from the 60s. And it was a sense of like opening up, be willing to get out of your regular comfort zone, exploring. And as a surfer, you started looking at the globe and saying, there's got to be so many, you know, really good waves out there. At that time, it was uh, some beach breaks that we had come across in Central America that were really great beach breaks, but there were like beach breaks anywhere else in the world. Petacalco was something, you know, completely different. It just broke so hard and so hollow. It was this great big wave place, but it was a beach break peak. It turns out that Pat Tobin and his crew from Laguna Beach had come across Petacalco years before, and they were making regular trips down there. There's a big lagoon just to the north where there's a large flush of sand that comes out, and that big estuary became a big port. That started to change all of the sand flow, and it just destroyed the wave. But Petacalco opened up more eyes to the potential of surf in Mexico. Everything you saw in the magazine had a huge impact. So if you saw a picture of a wave in Mexico, you'd just go, oh my God, we're there. Guys started going down there. They just started discovering more and more waves around. Puerto Escondido, in particular, was similar to how Petacalco broke in a lot of ways, probably even, even heavier. In the decades that followed, the small fishing village of Puerto Escondido became the ultimate beach break destination. The wave soon forged a reputation for its local surfers, who approached the Mexican pipeline with fearless panache. I'm Fidencio Silva, and I born in Puerto Escondido. Me and my two brothers, Chuy and Fernando, we start surfing here. The first guys we see go to Cicatela was uh, people from Venezuela. That's when we start. And then start coming the people from California, California, Texas. A lot of people, they start coming here, you know? They come and, and eat here in my mom's restaurant. Yeah, and everybody have party every night, you know? And we see in the wave, hey, you know, how are you? And yeah, all those days, you know, surfing and a party, you know? <laughs> My name is Carlos, but everybody calls me Coco Nogales, and uh, I'm from Puerto Escondido. The history of Puerto has always been, there's been always locals.
crew's got it dialed, man. Seeing their approach, the way they, they attack the wave, how critical they get, is just super impressive. The swells there come out of deep water, hit this sandbar, similar to like a reef. It really does resemble pipeline in a lot of different ways. It's really crowded there a lot of times and just has this thick lip that's like throwing out in front of you and you get these like fire hose spins. It's just intense. If you come here with respect, you're always gonna have respect back. Also the wave itself can put you in your place. You're not guaranteed to get a good wave, but you're guaranteed to get some sort of lesson. It's very tricky. It has like an open water power. You gotta be patient. You kind of have to ride a bigger board. The current's really, really powerful. You have to have balls. You have to make sure you want the right wave. Oh, it's the heaviest beach break in the world, I think. but it's mostly a closeout. Every now and then you get one that's makeable and you get these like mind expanding barrels there. What's so challenging about Puerto Escondido is to find the diamonds in the rough. You gotta put in a lot of time and effort and show people that you're ready to send it. Many people say Puerto is a close out. Some other people like the challenge. The balance is 50-50. You don't get many chances, but when you do get them, you'll get the ride of your life. Oh. Here we go. So there's a couple of incredible bathymetric contributions that make Zucatella break the way that it does. There's a canyon. There's a canyon between the bay and Zucatella, and it just comes from deep water ocean into the shore. When the swells come in, they follow that deep water line, and once they hit that sand bank, they do this 180 degree turn. It makes the wave just focus so much energy right close to the shore. It's like, boom, just huge teepees coming into the shoreline. lies off the northern end of Zicatella Beach and was carved out millions of years ago by freshwater runoff. This canyon now runs thousands of feet deep and amplifies the swells approaching Puerto Escondido. As these swells move abruptly from deep to shallow water, they refract and peak along Playa Zicatella. The end result is an oceanographic anomaly where open ocean swells measuring a few feet high can turn into 30-foot faces when they hit the shoreline. the swells come in there, they really do get magnified into that two or 300 yard area where the swells like triple the size of the other parts of the beach. It's such an expansive beach with so much current and so many elements that it really kind of, you know, equalizes the playing field where you know, if you're out there and you're patient, you, know, you can find yourself in position for the biggest and best wave of the day with nobody around you. It's 
really beautiful when you see all the elements coming together and the energy that brings to the town, it's incredible. But these days is rare. We went from a really small town and then every decade more and more people started to come to obviously the point where we are right now. But unfortunately there was not an actual plan for the town to grow. Infrastructure was never planned to be for a town growing as big. And this last three, four years, we have noticed a massive change. During COVID, Puerto was one of the few only places open to all tourism around the world. And then it became famous through social media and hashtags. The economy was bad, and a lot of local people needed to sell their lands. And that's when people with money came and started like a big development of the town. And we're right now in a crisis because our sewage is pretty much collapsed and everything is going in the water. development that has happened has had a massive impact in the way. When I was a kid, the sand dunes were huge, gigantic. And there was also this plant that used to bring these thorns that has a V form that is called cicatella. That's maybe where the name came from for the beach. If you wanted to go to where the water was, you had to come with sandals because otherwise it would be impossible to go across because there were so many thorns in the ground and lots of very alive vegetation and all of the constructions that happened along the beach kind of stole space from the nature for the sand to move around in a more natural way. And in 1998, they started building a jetty to help the fishermen with their boats. The current moves in Puerto from south to north, and that's what used to move the sand. And that sand will be pushed out into the canyon, and that canyon will bring the sand back where, where the lineup is. But when the jetty was built, all that sand flow stopped. And right now, there's pretty much a hundred meters of sand, like tons of sand that is not supposed to be there. It used to be an incredible beach ray where the waves will break far out, and now it has become a shore break pretty much. I mean, I remember surfing, going in Cicatella and the left and far bar, way out. The wave was way out. Now the wave breaks on the sand. right away feel the way it has way more power. It's definitely gotten a lot more hollow. There's more closeouts, there's more rips. The water doesn't know where to go. The sand is like cement. As soon as you hit the surface of the water, it feels like you hit the sand. It's incredibly dangerous because of that. It's so easy to break your neck or break your back or hit your head. Every day we have something. We are making many rescues, a lot of rescues for surfers, you know? So this area is in action, Cicatella, all the time, every day. We have like 500 rescues in the year, but we are just 10 lifeguards for all Puerto. And Cicatella Beach is like four kilometers, but now the tourist is, is growing, growing. And Puerto is growing so fast, so we need more lifeguard towers. We need new equipment, and we need more lifeguards. We need like 40 lifeguards in Puerto. There has been many, many incidents of heavy moments, and they don't necessarily happen when the waves are big. This wave can kill you. A wave 
wave breaking so close to the shore, it makes it really dangerous. I remember walking along the beach and seeing the set come through. It was like one of the most incredible, heaviest waves I've ever seen in my life. When you come to Porto, you kind of expect to sometimes wait three, four hours to get a wave. So I just thought like, I'm gonna sit a little bit further out and try to avoid getting caught inside and hopefully a good one comes my way. This beautiful big peak popped up and it looked like a, a bomb. As I kind of started getting locked into the wave, I just saw foam in front of me and I was just thinking, oh no. Bang, just like got hit so hard in my head. I grabbed my head and I could feel something away from my head, you know, I'm like, what is that? I came up, there was just loads of blood and I couldn't see properly. And there was another really big wave towering over me. And in that moment, I just said, God help me, God help me. I was about 15 meters from the beach and this massive rip formed right where I was. And the beach was right there and I could not get to it. All the guys kind of started racing towards me because they saw all the blood. All the surfers in the lineup just came around me and they like held my board, put their hands on me and they said, hey, you, you, you're gonna be okay, you're gonna be okay. Lifeguards launch the jet ski and it doesn't start. So we paddled for about half a kilometer down the beach to the safe zone where a fishing boat picked us up. We got to the shore and... Uh, no, 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 wait. Cut was really bad and they figured I need a surgeon, so I got wheeled into the surgery room. The surgeon was amazing. He was kind of explaining everything that's gonna happen. Just before he's about to start operating, he shows me the picture of my head. And I was just like, oh my gosh. Like, I could see my skull, a massive flap of skin all the way from the top of my eyebrow all the way into my hairline, peeled back. He saw my reaction, I was like, oh my gosh, it's really bad. He goes, photo looks small, much bigger, much bigger. It's not either amplier. He said, uh, yeah, that it's pretty free frequent when it comes to surfers. So it's really frequent that uh, they have injuries like this, especially like somewhere in the face or the head. Your surfboard is probably your biggest threat in, in big wave surfing. It's uh, literally like a weapon. It was a centimeter away from my eye. It could have hit me in the temple, could have knocked me out, and all the what ifs and possibilities are really scary, but at the same time, the biggest barrel you could paddle into could be out of Puerto Escondido. Every wave you drop into, you have no idea what's gonna happen, but it also can deliver the wave of a lifetime. The biggest it can handle, I mean, for sure 50, 60 foot, easily, and it's top to bottom. swell was one of a kind that was actually May 3rd 2015 that's the day that Mark Healy probably rode a 50-foot wave <laughs> I remember seeing what I was shooting, I remember seeing even bigger waves than that. The water was basically reaching the street. Most of the restaurants in the front, they were smashed. 
That was definitely one of the gnarliest and heaviest swells I have seen in my life. Puerto's definitely on the top 10 biggest scariest waves in the world, for sure. I remember when I first arrived to Puerto, I walk into Playa Cicatela and I sit down and I was watching gigantic waves for hours and I was like, wow. And there was like a couple of guys out there surfing and I was like, I want to do that, you know? One day I'm going to be surfing, you know, I want to do that. I was in Acapulco, you know, I was on the streets there with the street kids and a lot of things were going wrong. And when I landed here, I knew that it was going to be my home. Everybody was like a family, you know, and I feel like Puerto hold me like here. Thirty something years after this place means my whole life. It means everything that I am today. But it's changing, and I'm afraid that if it keeps going like this, this wave can disappear. And maybe tourism is not a problem in general. It's just like the town wasn't prepared for it. You know, wasn't prepared to grow so fast. The little town doesn't have the infrastructure and it cannot hold so many people. Sadly, it's part of the growth. Like, it happens everywhere. Change is inevitable. Growth is inevitable. But what has been amazing is how the community in recent years has galvanized together to protect their home. When there are some serious problems, the people get together, for sure. There were many little groups trying to do something. So the next move was to get together, and the plan now is to do it by the law so it lasts. In 2023, the local community and Save the Waves Coalition joined forces to fight rampant development and pollution in Puerto Escondido. The coalition recently scored a major victory, halting a massive development at Playa Colorado. But the fight is ongoing. Puerto's wave is still there, but it's dying. So we need help. Every day we are fighting and we need the help of everyone to protect Playa Cicatela. The plan is to keep working and add more people to the fight. It's kind of sad that it's becoming the way that it is. It's polluted, it's too big. I don't know, it's just not as good as it used to be. But no matter what, I will always have my heart stuck fully here in Puerto Escondido. It still happens. The magic still happens, but it's just a few times of the year. We have swells where it's just a perfect, perfect wave machine. But these days, those sessions don't happen very often. And when they do, well, they become precious. My step up to 175, 70 to 75. What do I wish I had? I definitely wish I had my 8 0. But just hopefully put ourselves in a position that if a good one does come, we're there for it. Like that one.
and I couldn't get out. I just said, take me. <laughs> I was stuck pinned on the bottom, jumped off, pinned on the bottom again, jumped off the sand again, tried to climb my leash, pinned again, and I was like, do it, hold down. It's like the worst beat down I've had that was in two entirely. years. There's not really anywhere else in Mexico that is anything like Puerto Escondido and really nowhere else in the world. This place is my life, my dream, my everything. It has given me everything I've ever wanted. All of the joy, all of the happiness. My family has grown here, my kids now growing here. It's the ultimate challenge. And when you do get the wave of your life, you really gotta just hold it close to your heart. Even though we have all these changes that is not like in the past, Puerto is still magical and I still have a lot of love and feeling of gratitude for the people from here. And it's thanks to Puerto, I am the person who I am today. I love this place. I'm born here in this restaurant and I'm gonna die here. <laughs> It's uh, the love of my life, pretty much. Uh, I will always have my heart stuck fully here in Puerto Escondido. Muchos ese sueño se nos han 